Hello, I am uh, Dr. Charles Gieschen. Welcome to a podcast for the Gospel reading uh, for Lent 2, uh, namely uh, the discussion of John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Notice that even though this is series A, which is focusing typically on Matthew, uh, namely readings from the Gospel of Matthew, today we have a text from John. John is scattered in series A, B, and C, and here during the Lenten season we have some readings from the Gospel of John. Uh, just by way of introduction, two brief things because we have a fairly long text to cover. Number one is that this text is very uh, helpful in the midst of the Lenten season because it focuses on what we might call anthropology or the study of the anthropos of man. Uh, it helps us to see our sinful nature uh, that's brought out very clearly in that which is flesh gives, is, is flesh, uh, and that which is of the spirit is spirit. And then secondly, uh, it's a wonderful text to speak about baptismal regeneration, namely of how we have a, a new begetting from God through holy baptism. And during the Lenten season, we focus on spiritual refreshment and renewal. Part of that focus is bringing people back to where they were rescued from sin and death through the Holy Spirit, bringing them to faith in the waters of baptism. And this text beautifully does that. Let's go now to the Greek text on the board. And uh, the text starts off, it's this very familiar encounter with Nicodemus. And we'll see that the discussion with Nicodemus, uh, this text is introduced right here at verse 1. Then it goes on to a dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus, somewhat typical of this one-on-one -on -one dialogue that you find in some uh, encounters in the Gospel of John. And then at verse 16, there's a shift where the narrator, the evangelist John, brings his voice in as sort of the summary. So we'll see that in verses 16 and 17. There we have the evangelist not just narrating and, and giving us the dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus, but him actually giving a theological summary of this whole pericope. Uh, it starts off with setting the scene. Uh, there's two, per, uh, two people. First of all, you have a man uh, who is from the Pharisees. There's two details about this Nicodemus, which is his name, um, namely that he is a man from the Pharisees, that tells us he's one who studies the law, who is concerned, but he's also a ruler of the Jews, so he's probably part of the Sanhedrin. So he's a very significant teacher uh, in, and uh, uh, overseer of the Jewish people. Uh, that helps set the scene in terms of later on. Jesus says, you don't understand earthly things, how can you understand heavenly things? He's helping uh, one who should be uh, a very significant uh, uh, under, person in understanding uh, the ways of God. He's helping him to see how, how blind he is. Uh, and then you have this one, namely Nicodemus, came to him, namely to Jesus, uh, by the night. That's an important detail in the sense that he was uh, probably a little afraid of being seen with Jesus during the day, and yet he had some questions. Um, and so he comes to Jesus, and he addresses him rather politely. Uh, he calls Jesus a rabbi. And then he also says, we know that you are a teacher. Here's the, um, here's the title that he gives to Jesus. And he even calls him politely, who has come from, perfect tense, from God. So actually, he thinks he's given Jesus a great compliment by addressing him as a rabbi and as a teacher who has come from God. He sees himself somewhat as an equal to Jesus, and so he's uh, basically treating him with some respect, and uh, then he even uh, compliments Jesus. See, he says, for no one um, is able to do, right here you have the infinitive, these signs, plural, and in John, signs are the things, the, the miracles that Jesus is doing. John 
refers to them as samaya or signs because they point beyond themselves to Jesus' divine identity. Uh, the signs which you are doing, um, and then you have if not, and we would translate this in English, unless, if not, God is with him. So he is basically not only said he's a teacher from God, but he even compliments him by saying theos, God is with him. So what he considers a compliment, Jesus sees through this. Um, this um, Nicodemus' understanding is very limited, uh, and Jesus cuts right to the chase. He responds, Jesus answered, and he said to him, namely to Nicodemus, Amen, Amen, we have that several times in this pericope. It's uh, the double, um, Amen, Amen, signaling the importance of what Jesus is, is going to say. It's sort of a red flag to get our attention to the importance of what Jesus is saying. So he cuts right to the chase. Uh, Nicodemus gives what he, he thinks is a rather complimentary address to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Um, he says, Aon, uh, this is a conditional sentence. You have the subjunctive verb, unless someone, uh, unless one is, is begotten um, from above. This term is often translated again. So unless one is begotten or born begotten again. Another way that it's translated is above. And we know from John 3.31, Jesus speaks about being from above. This is the very much preferred translation. It's often uh, misunderstood in terms of, again, it's a possible translation. But what's what Jesus is emphasizing, unless one is begotten by God from the divine realm, um, one is not able to see, here is a metaphor for believing, is seeing the kingdom of God. We see this theme in the synoptic gospels a lot, and here is one place where it's found in the gospel of John, is the emphasis on God's reign being brought into people's lives. So unless one is begotten from above, namely from God, from the divine realm, uh, one is not able to see the kingdom of God. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot come to our faith. This is a wonderful text that's emphasizing monergism. God acts to bring us to faith. God acts to save us. Uh, and that's uh, brought out beautifully in this verse. This is a present conditional sentence where you have eon plus the, um, plus the subjunctive verb and then you have the present tense verb in the... Um, in the apodosis, the second half uh, and of the sentence. And so this is true not only for Nicodemus, but this is true for all mankind. Unless you're begotten from God, from the divine realm, from above, you are not able to see the kingdom of God, namely to believe and be saved. Uh, then he goes on in verse 4. You have then Nicodemus responding to him, on saying how, you have that interrogative, how is a man able to be begotten being um, uh, already an old man? Uh, he is not able to enter into the womb of his mother a second time uh, <clears throat> to, uh, and to uh, be begotten. Okay, So the entering into the womb a second time is just showing Nicodemus's puzzlement that Jesus is using this uh, born from above language, this being begotten from above language. He doesn't get it, and he shows his puzzlement. So Jesus restates what he said in a very parallel structure. You can see it. Amen, amen. So he says that once more. And then... Another conditional sentence, another present general conditional with the on plus the subjunctive verb. Only this time, he unpacks what does it mean to be begotten from above? It means to be begotten of water and the Spirit. And this chi is joining these two and very closely. 
Uh, it's a, a reference to baptism, not a reference to natural birth, water breaking for a mother, and then later a, a spiritual birth, i.e. From, from the Spirit. It's emphasizing a birth that encompasses the Spirit working in water. This is a, one of the clear texts that speaks about how um, spiritual regeneration happens through the waters of holy baptism, the Spirit joins himself with water and word in order to accomplish this, mirac this uh, miraculous uh, be being born from above. So unless one is begotten of water and the Spirit, so we have a little more specificity to what it means to be begotten from above, uh, one is not able to enter. Here's another metaphor, just as you have this language of to see the kingdom of God, to enter the kingdom of God. And it's a metaphor for salvation. When we enter the kingdom of God, we then have all the benefits of salvation. So again, unless we have God's working through water and the Spirit, we aren't able to uh, come to faith. God is the one who brings that miraculous um, gift of, a, of a union with Him, of faith within Him uh, about through the water uh, and, uh, and uh, the water and the Spirit, namely baptism. Verse 6, uh, Jesus here, and this is a great thing for our, our, Lent, our Lenten tide preaching, namely this emphasis on who we are without Christ. And here, uh, we, this is what we would call the uh, teaching about anthropology, who the anthropos or the man is, the one begotten, Ectes sarcus, the one begotten of flesh, is flesh. And here you have an example of sarcus and sarx, the same term used in two different ways, namely the one who is born of human flesh is flesh. Flesh there in the second time is being used to speak about our fallen sinful condition. So the one who is born naturally, human uh, parents, inherits the sinful condition. This is the teaching uh, that we would say in theological terms as is original sin. It's a teaching about original sin. Jesus says elsewhere in John, um, the one who, uh, who commits sin or does sin is a slave to sin, uh, John chapter 8. This is the same kind of teaching. Uh, if we're born of human beings, sarcus, then we are, we are in bondage to sin, namely we are of the flesh. Here the second time flesh is used, it's used in the same way Paul often uses it, namely, this is where Paul no doubt drew his teaching from, the difference between flesh and spirit. So the, the flesh is our fallen sinful condition, um, original sin, and the Spirit is that which gives new life to, to our fallen um, life, our sinful life. So, and then he says, and the one begotten, and again, this same language, here you have a perfect tense participle, so who has been begotten in the past, continues to be begotten, is, um, so the one begotten of the Spirit is Spirit. So, the emphasis here, of the, the, the difference between just being in the fallen condition or being um, reborn, being begotten of the Spirit. And so you have a further unpacking of what this birth of water and the Spirit does. When we're begotten of the Spirit, we actually have the new um, condition uh, with us. Namely, we are... Um, begotten of the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who always joins us with Jesus and his saving work. And that's what's being taught here. Let's scroll down so we get a little bit more of the text on the screen. Um, so we're at uh, verse 7, and we'll uh, scroll. Very good. And starting at verse 7, uh, Jesus says, he recognizes that uh, Nicodemus has been... Um, a little bit uh, confused in terms of what he's been saying. So he says, do not uh, marvel uh, that I say this to you. 
Um, it is necessary. Here is the verb of divine necessity, the die verb. Jesus uses it in different times in his, his ministry and preaching. It is necessary for you to be begotten from above. So, again, picking up on that language he introduced above uh, when he first started this dialogue with Nicodemus. And then, <clears throat> this is a verse that's often mistranslated, verse 8. Sometimes it's translated, ta pneuma is translated, the wind blows where it will. Uh, I would argue that the comparison here is not between wind and the one begotten of the Spirit, but between the Spirit, as pneuma is used here, it's being used um, as a reference to the Spirit. So what Jesus is saying here is the Spirit blows where he desires, and you, you hear his voice, namely you know the Spirit is active, but you do not know from where he comes and where he goes. Namely, he is active in a way that goes beyond our human understanding. We cannot simply rationally explain the Spirit and His powerful work. And what Jesus is saying, just as that is true, so also we can't rationally understand. He says, thus is with everyone who has been begotten, that perfect participle again, of the Spirit. We cannot rationally understand how water and word in baptism brings about new birth, new life, faith in Jesus Christ, um, taking us from the, the death of being enslaved to sin to being free in Christ. We can't rationally understand that just as we can't rationally understand how the Spirit works so powerfully. Uh, so just as it is with the Spirit, so it is with the ones begotten of the Spirit. That is the comparison in verse 8, not between wind and the one begotten of the Spirit. Uh, that actually, I would say, doesn't make much uh, sense. Uh, even though pneuma can be translated wind, here Jesus is speaking about the Spirit. So the comparison is between the Spirit and our inability to understand Him, as well as our inability to really rationally understand or explain how one through water in the Spirit can be begotten uh, and be given new life. Uh, namely, being taken from spiritual death, because that's what the flesh gives birth to flesh. That means we're in spiritual death. And yet, yet the Spirit um, brings us life. So the movement from spiritual death to spiritual life is being illustrated here in these verses. And then what does Nicodemus, uh, uh, Nicodemus answered and said to him? Uh, again, he's opposing all these interrogatives, these questions. How um, uh, are these things able to be? Uh, so he shows his misunderstanding. So Jesus further ex uh, explains or talks. He says, you are a teacher. So he uses the title that Nicodemus gave to him, and he flips it back to Nicodemus. You are a teacher of Israel. So Nicodemus is not only a Pharisee, not only a ruler, but he's also one of the teachers as a Pharisee. Uh, and you do not know these things. I think what he's basically criticizing is Nicodemus doesn't even understand his sinful nature, his spiritual death that he's born with. So how is he going to understand what Jesus is talking about in terms of needing a spiritual birth? And that's what the point he makes in verse 11. Again, the amen, amen, we've seen that twice before. Jesus is uh, saying something very important. I say to you that we know, and here you have Jesus speaking in the plural, uh, he's already called his disciples. They are already beginning to be part of a united voice. So I think what he's speaking about is here um, is not only his own personal message, but also what he has instructed his disciples to proclaim. We know what we um, are, have, are speaking, and what we have seen we are bearing witness to, and our witness you have not received. Namely, Nicodemus and some of his fellow Jews are rejecting the testimony or witness, the martyreion that Jesus is giving, both about who we are as human beings, sinful, fallen human beings, flesh giving birth to flesh, but also upon then our, because of that, our need for a spiritual rebirth that's brought in holy baptism. 
verse 12. Uh, and then he says, uh, uh, <clears throat> if I, um, I say to you these things of the earth and you are not believing them, namely I'm telling you about your own sinful nature and you aren't believing, how if I tell you concerning the heavenly things will you believe? And I think here he is talking about the fact that very shortly he's going to talk more about salvation. He's already spoken, one might say, the law of the fact that we are sinful and need a birth from above. Here he's going to speak more directly about the things, the mysteries of heaven that are coming about as Jesus is taking action against sin, delivering us from sin. Uh, and verse 13 goes on. Uh, and no one has ascended, here you have the perfect tense, into the heavens except the one who has descended from heaven. Namely, there were some Jews that believed Moses had gone up to heaven, brought very special revelation. Jesus is emphasizing that he is the eternal son who has always descended and given revelation to mankind, including Moses, including Abraham, including uh, the various prophets. Uh, he's been the source of the revelation as he is descended. They haven't gone up to heaven. He has come from heaven and, uh, and now finally as the incarnate son is giving the ultimate revelation. He's the only source of revelation. No one has seen the Father except the Son, and the Son has descended and revealed the Father. That's a, a theme in the Gospel of John. So, except the Son of, uh, of Man. And so, he is the eternal Son. That's a favorite title of Jesus in all the Gospels. The Daniel 7, he is that eternal Son, the enthroned Son, who has come and revealed God now climactically through taking on human flesh and revealing God in the flesh and blood Jesus. And then he uses this typological relationship between the Old Testament to illustrate his work beautifully. Uh, so here, in a sense, are some of the heavenly things that, that uh, Jesus is now speaking to Nicodemus about. And just as, here you have the comparison being brought up between the Old Testament and Jesus' work, just as Moses lifted up the serpent, and here's the numbers, numbers 21 rescue of Israel in the wilderness when they were bitten by, by serpents, and then a serpent is lifted up. This foreshadows the kind of gracious deliverance that is one for us in Jesus. Just as people just had to look at that serpent and they were healed in Numbers 21, so also right here, the, the nice typological uh, comparison. This is a type of then Jesus' action. It's a pattern that we see in the Old Testament that helps us understand Jesus' actions. So also, it is necessary, we see that divine necessity verb once again, uh, for the Son of Man, we see again that title of Jesus, Son of Man, to be lifted up. By the way, this is from Isaiah 52, 13. In the Septuagint, you have this verb used for, this, for the suffering servant. He's going to be lifted up or exalted. And so this sets up all that the, the servant will do that's spoken about in Isaiah 53. So when Jesus uses this verb, he's using it because he understands himself as that suffering servant who will be lifted up or exalted by God. And when does that lifting up happen? It's clear if you look at how this verb is used in the Gospel of John, it's referring to Jesus' death, his lifting up on the cross. Not his ascension, but his lifting up on the cross. So just as the serpent was on, on a pole, and people just looked and were saved. So Jesus will be lifted up on the cross as the source of salvation. When we believe in our, the crucified Christ, that, that through his death, he's atoning for our sins, we are graciously saved. It's a, that's the pattern. Uh, that's just as in the Old Testament, so now, so, so now with Jesus. And then you have, in order that the one believing in him has 
eternal life. And here you have a beautiful emphasis that's coming out in these next few verses of eternal life. The book of, Rev the book of John, the Gospel of John, emphasizes life is found in Jesus alone, not with heart beating brain waves, but when we're born from above, we move from death to life. And it's a life that goes on eternally, and it's a life that climaxes with resurrection. And you see the emphasis on this now with verses 16. Let's scroll up one last time for these last two verses. And with verses 16 and 17, we have here uh, uh, John, the gospel writer, leaving off, this is where the, the um, dialogue with Nicodemus ends, and here John, as the evangelist, is summarizing a very important theological point. We've often called this the gospel in the nutshell, John 3.16, but it's a, a beautiful uh, expression. It starts off with the, the just as, we saw that kind of construction earlier, for just as God loved the world. Here you have that beautiful uh, verb, um, agapatse uh, sen, uh, the same verb that's used so often by Jesus to speak about God's love for us. Here, God is the subject. He is loving. The object is the world. His love is absolutely inclusive. It includes the whole world. So, uh, and that means it includes every human being, if it includes the whole world. Uh, and then you have the hosta, the result clause. What is the result of God's action of loving the world? Then he actually takes the action of giving. So God doesn't just love the world and have a warm fuzzy going up his back. Rather, that love leads to action uh, with the result that he gives, and the giving here is the sending into the world and the death of Jesus. So it's actually emphasizing the Father handing over the Son. This is from Genesis 22, where the sacrifice that God called upon Abraham to make with Isaac, he stops. Why? Because he will provide the sacrifice. What is the sacrifice ultimately? It is God giving his own son uh, as the, the payment for our sins. So he gave his only begotten son. And that uh, certainly uh, calls to mind uh, the typology between Isaac and Jesus. Isaac being the only son of Abraham. In order that, why? Uh, what's the purpose? So we have the result clause here. The result of the love of God to the world is he, he gives his only son, sending him into the world, giving him unto death. And what's the purpose of all this? In order that everyone who believes in him not perish, the negative statement, and then the positive statement, but have what? Again, the emphasis, not only zoe, life, but eternal life. Eternal life that will one day climax in resurrection. We're thinking of that already in this Lenten season as we move towards the Easter. And then finally, this last verse, for God did not send, here's the, the, the uh, negative statement, the Son into the world in order to condemn the world. Uh, namely, his purpose is saving. His uh, con condemnation is the alien work of the Son. The primary work of the Son is what? To save. What a beautiful word for our Lenten season. Uh, Christ came into the world to save sinners. But in order to save the world, Jesus saves every sinner. Uh, not every sinner comes to faith and receives the benefits of that, but their sins have been paid for. He has saved the world. Um, and so God saved the world through the Son, through the Son's sacrifice. Uh, there's several things here that are obviously wonderful to proclaim uh, in these Lenten days, both uh, our own sinfulness, uh, our need for spiritual um, uh, begetting or spiritual rebirth, and how that birth happens through water and, and baptism, and how all of that is um, giving us the benefits of what God has done in giving us the Son 
who has saved the world through his own sacrifice. May the Lord bless your proclamation of that in this second Sunday of Lent.